Hello everyone, thanks for inviting me uh, and uh, I've been very impressed by this talk so far I'm looking forward to the rest of the event. Uh, so yeah, I'll be giving my talk on the fact checking as a conversation. So okay, fact checking, I think by now you've heard enough about it, but just in case, it's a worldwide phenomenon, there are the most fact checking organizations around the world. Uh, one thing that has uh, happened uh, recently, while it's an old phenomenon as was already said, uh, social media helped both information and misinformation spread more rapidly. But what has not changed is that a manual fact check takes the same amount of time, hours or even days. In fact, people often fact check pick one thing to work on for the rest of the day. Um, and uh, yeah, so we need to we want to do things to help uh, improve their efficiency. So, so what do they do to make it more concrete? Here's a claim about uh, immigration and an organization called factcheck.eu went through the numbers back when this claim was made, and then in this case concluded that this was a false claim because they couldn't find data to support it, and the UK does not have 10 times Italy's number of immigrants. And um, what we want to do with automated fact checking is have some kind of uh, uh, software, so a transformator of sorts, you might want to call it. That's actually from PolitiFact. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we'd like to actually assist uh, the humans in producing these kind of verdicts. And perhaps uh, uh, maybe these days it's not just claims made by humans, but it could be claims made by generative AI like ChatGPT. And maybe you want to use something like ChatGPT to actually fact check ChatGPT or another human. These things are happening already, right? Um, so I, I think the previous talk made it clear. Uh, but yeah, that's also relevant in this case. So, okay. Uh, so I'm kind of a, a national language processing machine learning researcher, and all the questions are, what can we do to help with artificial intelligence? And okay, I'm sure you can, you know that you yeah, have vision, and especially cats, very important on the web, and they can recognize them very, very well. And uh, you can see, yeah, the systems work very well for that. Uh, having said that, though, despite the successes, there are also some issues about interpretability, which matter, right? So this is the next case of the comic, that kind of made this, uh, put it quite well. Yeah, this machine learning system, yeah, you put data, you train your model to recognize cats or something, and then you get the answer on the other side, and yeah, what if the answers are wrong? Well, you just stir the data a bit and the, and the maths and, you know, you come out right. Because essentially we're still trying to understand how these systems work exactly. It's a, that's an ongoing work, but good work. Um, so, but even before we start building these systems, it might be good to think of what we want from them. Um, so, first thing I'd say is evidence. You know, if you don't give me, if you don't get evidence, you shouldn't be convinced. And uh, it doesn't matter who gave you the label, a human or a machine. Another thing that's very important is that uh, labels alone are not conducive to fact-based discourse. And in fact, that's what you want, right? You don't want to say true or false. You actually what more useful is to see the evidence. And in fact, uh, some fact checking organizations have already stopped putting labels on their fact checks altogether. They just say, give the evidence and some rationale behind it. Um, another thing from the social who build systems, like you want to be, it helps me help the check, uh, helps, uh, it helps, the evidence helps check the correctness of the fact checks. That's also very important. I can tell what the system is wrong if I know the evidence is using how it was used. Um, the other thing we want is we want to be able to learn with relatively little data. So, uh, be it cut recognition or, say, machine translation, which is another success story, I think, where essentially 20 years ago when I started working on this, Automatic translation was nowhere near as good as it got in the last decade or so. That was partly due to advances in the, in the models, but also advances in the fact being able to use the European Parliament proceedings, for example, translated in all languages of the European Union. That's been a great source of data. Mm -hmm. But we won't get this kind of data because, as I mentioned earlier, a fact check can take hours or days, so you know, it's not as fast as uh, translating a sentence. So we, get, we won't get the same scale. Another thing to, to bear in mind, actually, I've learned something already today, <laughs> the term white hat bias is if you want to think about the intended use, so you can build the model, right? You can, build the, you can build a classifier if you want. You can build something more complicated than that. But, you know, you, we can, and we get some, report some accuracy. But we, and we can write in the paper, and I've found when I, I when I start thinking about this, I went throw back to my old papers, and I found similar things. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll build the system that'll combat misinformation. But it might be good to think also how this is going to be used. You know, who is going to use the system? Whose claims are going to be fact-checked? Right? It's not just enough to just build systems. I mean, we, it's good that we can do this, but it's better if we think about the intended uses, who is going to use it, on whose claims, how, and so on. And these are things that we discussed, um, especially the first couple of things, items in our first paper on the topic in 2014, and now we have another paper in 2023 where we discuss the intended use now that the field has taken off a bit. Um, so, okay. As an overview of how it works in the, in the field of NLP, we typically have, say, claim detection, 
uh, say you're given a speech by a politician or some piece, or it could be a scientific piece, and you want to detect the claims, uh, then you want to decide, once you decide which claims you are going to fact check, you want to do evidence retrieval. That's important, even if you're not going to do this manually, uh, sometimes this uh, evidence retrieval step can take quite a while and can be quite resource intensive. You might have to pay Google, say, to get access to their queries, uh, mechanisms, and so on. And then you have to produce a verdict, so a label about the claim, and then a justification for that, because it's not enough just to have the label and the evidence. The justification tells you how the evidence was used to produce the verdict. Um, and you can read more about this in our surveys. Um, so one thing that became clear to me when I started working on this is that we needed data sets. And here's a table that was compiled by someone named Mr. Koss on a, on a blog post. And I think well, we, can, uh, we can have a health debate about what's a breakthrough in AI, what's human level performance, and so on. But the message he was trying to convey, and I think it's accurate, is that you know, it's not enough to have the algorithms. In fact, the data set availability makes advances possible and brings them perhaps faster. And you know, again, I would say uh, the Q-learning algorithm of 1992 probably is not the same as the 2015 version of that that DeepMind used. But the, but the message is that we needed the, the, the data set, which is like the arcade environment of Fatari. And um, so then, so in response to this, we actually produced a data set we call Fact Extraction Verification Fever. Or essentially, we have claims like this that we act actually had the humans produce, they wrote them down for us. And then other humans, uh, they were all Amazon employees in this case, uh, took these claims, went back to Wikipedia, and found evidence, and then put a label, or they supported, refuted, or there was not enough information in Wikipedia to verify this claim. And uh, we were able to produce things to Amazon support, a pretty large one, uh, the largest still, I think, uh, of this kind of data set, with 185,000 claims verified on Wikipedia. Now, the key difference, and the reason we went through this, was because until then, pretty much all data sets had just claims and labels, no evidence. Since they, you know, here's a claim, has these words, maybe some, some things about the source, but we already heard, and I'm definitely in agreement, that uh, knowing what, who said it, it shouldn't affect the judgment on misinformation. Propaganda, other things, yes, but you know, misinformation is about the content, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and the point of this is that we required systems to return the evidence for the verdict to be correct. If you gave the wrong evidence, it doesn't matter if you put the right label, it was wrong. And that gave, uh, essentially, helped people improve their systems, and uh, you know, we had five years now of this. Uh, results got better, there's a leaderboard now. I should say, after a point now, we definitely see that people are essentially overfitting the data set and the noise it has, because like all this it has some noise and some biases and so on. So I would say that it's, it's a good thing, it's a good academic exercise, but it's important to remember when I report things that, you know, we're not solving issues, yeah, he said, uh, now that it's close to 80%, it's not like our systems are 80% good at detecting misinformation you find on the web, so it's 80% uh, on this data set. Mm -hmm. um, hey, but these were claims that um, we had annotators make up, and the evidence was taken on Wikipedia, right? And that's typically not what we're after, right? Uh, because, and, but we made this choice because by restricting the evidence to be selected from Wikipedia, we'd actually then say, right, if you found the right evidence or not, we can tell because we only told you we, to use Wikipedia. So it was easy for us to do a reasonably exhaustive search for the evidence in Wikipedia. Um, but the, the problem with that is that, well, but Wikipedia is not all the source of evidence we need, right? All the, there's lots of evidence in all sorts of specialized knowledge sources that we should use instead, often. And um, the claims that we are dealing with were made up by our annotators. Uh, well, they're not the same kind of claims that are targeted by real-world fact-checkers and what the public wants to know the, the, the labels and the evidence for. And the problem with doing that, because there have been attempts on that, is that... Uh, yeah, you know, the evidence then is like, you take the, so you can take the labels, you can go to PolitiFact, they even had an API at some point, you could download the claims and the labels. Great. But uh, the evidence then, we say, okay, uh, how about we just Google the claim and we'll call all the top 10 results as, we'll call, it, we'll call that evidence. There's no reason though to do that, right? I mean, you know, as actually was said earlier, you can find the evidence only for one side, like, you know, increase, decrease, the, the decline of the, of the fauna, right? So you can, if you search the claim, you find only one side of the evidence sometimes, depending on what it is. Um, the other part you can get is actually pages that were created after the claim, including fact checks. But then if you had the fact checking done on the claim, well, why are you going to do this? What, what's the point of this? The point is that you want to take the claim, do the fact checking, and then write the piece to communicate the results. 
Um, for this, actually, we actually produced uh, another data set, we called Vertec, which uh, just got published, and um, we took claims from fact checking organizations, from the uh, claim review API that Google has provided, uh, it has made public, and then we had actually, um, we put the context back, because sometimes the claim was exactly verbatim from the speech, so it would like some context for that, which country uh, we're talking about when we are saying succeed in reducing greenhouse emissions. That could be said in the, talk, the USA part could be omitted. When was it made? Which year are we talking about? So, so what put these things back? Then what we did is that we took the fact checking article and then we actually asked our auditors to re sort of deconstruct the fact check, which is usually kind of a piece of prose, a paragraph or a page, say, and write it down in the form of questions and answers. Questions that the, the fact checkers asked implicitly or explicitly. And then we asked them to find the answers for these questions on the web. Right? So they had to be able to go back. But they were not allowed to use us to, to use as the source of the answer the fact checking page itself. Because the point is that mm -hmm. these fact checkers found these answers somewhere else in order to put it there. And that's what we wanted. In fact, uh, to make sure that, uh, well, to the extent we could, uh, we actually tried to make sure that they wouldn't find information that was posted after the claim. So we actually had the, we gave them a restricted Google API, essentially, where they could only search for information posted before the web. Now, of course, we relied on Google to give us the time post, but okay, we but that helped a lot. I mean, but it was not perfect. Um, and then we had the four-way classification. And in fact, uh, unlike the the previous, when we we when we made up the claims on Wikipedia, supported, refuted. We don't do true false because that's uh, not exactly what we do here. It's about evidence and the claim, right? It's not about universal truth, and, and not enough evidence. That's fine, but we found out pretty soon that we really needed the fourth label of which we call completing evidence or cherry picking. That's often a, that's a misleading part, for example, that Sander talked earlier, because essentially sometimes you might find evidence on both for both uh, uh, by both of the claim is support, supported by this evidence and other evidence might be refuting it. For example, it depends on how you measure greenhouse emissions, and you can get deep supporting and refuting evidence. So we didn't think that our systems should be developed so that they would actually tell you to choose one, but we shouldn't, as they said, there's not enough evidence either. So in, in, that's why we put the completing evidence cherry picking label. And um, we had some quality checks and so on. Um, it was uh, essentially for each of these, it took about an hour actually of an annotator, of oh, actually five annotators in total to verify all of this. And, um, and then, in the end, they also had to write justifications on how the evidence is co combined to give the label to the claim. Um, so, and we built a system for that, which um, relies on Google. Uh, we do search for that uh, for the top 30 pages. And what we did is that we use uh, Bloom, which uh, is uh, perhaps not as well known as other uh, language models, but it's actually an open source counter counterpart of uh, GPT-3, if you like. The, it's at la that level, say, of, uh, of uh, quality. Which is pretty good, actually. GPT-3, but not as good as GPT-4, say, but still, when it came out, it was quite a thing. And uh, so that helps us actually generate questions about the claim, which we use as queries uh, to Google. That, uh, and then from that, we actually select the evidence. Uh, we take the top 100 paragraphs that are in terms of the similarity to the claim. And then what we do is that we generate questions again for this paragraph, and then we classify them for relevance to the claim. Now, the trick here is that uh, sometimes, the way the evidence is phrased in the paragraph and the way the claim is phrased can be quite distant in terms of like the phrasing. But if you actually generate questions, what you kind of say is that what answers would I get from this, uh, what evidence would I get from this paragraph if I ask some questions? So which, uh, uh, which questions would this paragraph answer? And that essentially helps bridge the gap between the claim and the, and the paragraph through the evidence. And, um, and then in the end, so we combine this, uh, the, the question answer with its claim, as, and then we classify them as a support, refute, or irrelevant. And then if it's mixed, we have a conflicting evidence case. If it's uh, only one side, well, it's either support or refuted, fine. Um, or we have the case of not enough evidence. And you can see the results. And um, so, okay, first we had a, a model where we say no search. You just generate questions, but you then classify the claim based on that without any searching on the web. Which you can see that the questions were right, but uh, yeah, the classification results of the veracity were pretty poor. Um, then we had a version where you said, okay, we use the gold evidence, the one that the humans had put for the claim. 
And you can see that, uh, well, the equations are perfect, the equations and answers are perfect. Now, the veracity, though, the prediction is still 50%, less than 50%, in fact. This is a forward classification, so it's not like worth and random, but still not great, I'd say. Um, the third part is the Veritech, that's our approach, where essentially uh, you can see that, okay, we'll generate questions and we'll get some answers. Uh, you can see that uh, the, they're far from perfect, actually, they're not great. And uh, actually, they, and then we produce the veracity. Bear in mind that actually now we require, if the evidence was considered incorrect, it doesn't matter what the label was, right? So it's not, uh, so again, we, it's conditioned on the evidence. I should say we have developed an automatic metric for evidence, a comparison of the evidence we retrieve to what the humans were retrieving. Uh, it's far from perfect. In fact, I think it's quite generous to our systems. And that goes for all of this. Um, and uh, last thing we tried is that, well, you know, we're in 2023. We have to try to GPT, right? Uh, we did that. And um, actually, we proved it in various ways. We gave it some in-context learning. We tried some tricks around it. Yeah, but so you can see the questions are actually good. It asks good questions. That's a good thing. The answers, though, are lacking. I mean, they're not terrible, but uh, the, the problem is that they're not just wrong. Sometimes they're just really, really dangerous. Like uh, there was one claim which was related to healthcare, and then the Sanjibiti had given a, a thing, a piece that said, uh, oh, according to an announcement by some American Health Association, which had never happened. It was just false completely, right? But it looks so plausible, right? I mean, you say, yeah, I mean, maybe, I should, maybe it happened. I mean, it, sometimes it gives you things that happen, right? It's not like it always hallucinates. So, yes. So, and, so I think this says that, you know, compared to what I was saying with uh, fever from five years ago, the data set on Wikipedia, we have a long way to go to improve our systems. Um, that brings me to the future work. So one of the things that we are not necessarily dealing with yet is the uh, evidence trustworthiness, right? So we take essentially whatever Google returns that, I mean, they do some trustworthiness of their own, and that's what uh, helps rank their search results, but we're not judging that. The same way with not just Wikipedia, which, like all encyclopedias, is pretty good, but it has mistakes too. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that we haven't worked on yet, but I think it's very important, is claim detection prioritization, because even if you actually take a, a system like this, you still have to wait some time to run the results, and you have to pay money to open AI or to Google to actually run the various components that you need. Uh, it would be infeasible from an academic perspective to run the search engine of, the, of Google's quality, right? That's not what we should be doing with our resources. And so that's why even, and of course, uh, human factors actually, that's what they really need at this point. They, they, that's why they use AI already. Um, and now, so that brings me to the next point. We actually have a project now that we are going to try to transfer some of the infrastructure, this kind of deconstruction of the fact check into a question answering process. We want to port it to a real world fact checking organization, see how that could be implemented in their process, in their daily work. And the uh, other thing is that, uh, you know, I've talked about text so far, but there's images and videos, like you know, deep fakes that we've already seen, as well as other languages. And that's actually a big question, right? You know, um, sure, uh, one of the things that you will find out if you look at Wikipedia is that uh, mistakes on Wikipedia in English are correctly much faster than in languages that are not as, well, as uh, dominant in the world, right? <laughs> and there's a good reason. More eyes on it, more fixes. The fixes the come faster. And... Um, so, and so then, but then that begs the question, do we need dedicated models for its language, or do we want, uh, or can we translate everything to English, say? I think the answer is uh, that we should actually work at languages specifically. There are cultural biases, there are nuances that are not captured if you just translate things. But because of the lack of data sets, actually, and we built our data in English only so far, um, yeah, we, it's something that we want to investigate. So it's more like gut feeling rather than knowledge that I can share with you at this point. Um, so, and now moving on to the conversational part. So one of the things while we've been doing this work is that uh, the way I think of it is that misinformation and fact checking are kind of social processes, right? They don't happen in a vacuum. We talk to each other and, you know, we agree, we disagree. Sometimes it works better, sometimes not. And in fact, our social media can help us see outside the bubble, according to somebody says this, but uh, also increase polarization at the same time, which is kind of like, yeah, hmm, good and bad, but, and so, what correlates with more constructive conversations and how we can intervene to make them happen is the question for the second part. And uh, I assume by now yeah, everybody knows Wikipedia on the, on the right hand or left hand side as you're looking. I don't know how many you know Wikitribune. Right. So Wikitribune is actually the effort of the Wikipedia founder 
to create a Wikipedia for fact checks. Which, when I, I heard about it, it was like, fantastic. I mean, uh, that's my data set. <laughs> you know, I won't have to do all of this. I will just take the data set from there. Um, it didn't take off the ground despite a lot of efforts. My point is that you know, there, are many, there are probably many reasons uh, for this, but my point is that it, the success of Wikipedia, which I think of it as the most successful large scale online conversation ever, uh, the, the signal to noise ratio in Wikipedia is much higher than anything that appears online in my mind, uh, is not easy to replicate, right? Even if you are the founder of Wikipedia who <laughs> made it happen in the first instance. So there are many reasons for that, but I think it's like, you know, maybe. Maybe the question is not how we can make it happen again, but more like what, what lessons can we learn from the success of Wikipedia and maybe transfer to today's online ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And um, so we started by looking at disputes in Wikipedia. Actually, Wikipedia, the, each page has its talk page. But then there's a separate part where essentially you go to have a dispute. So it's not just talking. You agree, you disagree. And you go and have a dispute on a dedicated page about something. and. Um, so, and we actually co compiled this based on those conversations. We also took the summaries from the edit. So when you make edits to Wikipedia, you put a comment on what you edited. That's actually part of the conversation in some sense. And then we created this kind of data set. And then what we were looking for, essentially in these pages that uh, you know which of these disputes were escalated to moderation by a human volunteer and which were resolved without that. And we use that as a proxy for constructiveness, right? If you could resolve the disagreement, the dispute without escalation, that's constructive. If you had to ask for a moderator, that was not as constructive, at least. And um, Wikipedia actually has uh, some guidelines on how to uh, disagree. And in fact, these are due to Graham, Paul Graham, who's actually perhaps better known for being one of the co-founders of uh, Y Combinator, um, who's a, a startup incubator. But she put that essay a while back now, actually. And, uh, and that's what Wikipedia suggests to, the, to its users to use in uh, their disputes. So, but there are other things you can consider, like politeness, toxicity, sentiment. I mean, some of them correlate with this, but we'll see in a minute. We did some research on that. So we actually built models to learn these things, and we looked at uh, how well we can predict these labels. And uh, the best features were actually uh, collaboration and politeness and, uh, and these to combine were even better. One thing that we saw was actually we kind of did a linear fit on how, given how we measure collaboration and politeness in the conversation. We also looked at the gradients as they go there, the collaboration marks increase or decrease in the conversation or the politeness is going up or down. And we found that this helped. And we started some neural models. Uh, yeah, they work better, but I think we're still in to look at the feature based models to see, to see how well they can be used to predict these labels. Um, and here's actually what was happening. So this is a cherry-picked example. So you can see a conversation here. Uh, so we have a classification threshold above which the conversation would be considered to be likely to be escalated. And then the, it would actually be, uh, and then below the threshold would be resolved. So this is a cherry-picked example, right? This is a case where the system works well. And uh, you can see here, in this case, that it would say, okay, uh, you can see that the up, up, above a certain, initially it's, it's very hostile, the tone, and it kind of captures that. And then as it gets trendier, more contractive, uh, it actually starts predicting below the threshold. And then you know, the, the uncertainty of the model actually also decreased over time as it saw more, more affluence in the conversation. That was quite pleasing on the whole. But also I think it helps illustrate what was going on here. Um, we also applied then Graham's hierarchy. We had to do extra notation. We had a professional linguist who actually applied the labels from Graham as well with some modifications to this data. And we found actually that, um, yeah, the, actually these labels uh, correlate with constructiveness. So it's a, good, it's a good guideline, perhaps not the only thing you should do, but it's a good starting point. And uh, it also helped us predict the escalation better. Um, another thing that we did was actually in the context of how we can communicate facts, uh, is that uh, it was, we worked on open-mindedness. And uh, so and we did also a joint project with Open University Sheffield and Toshiba Research. And the idea is that to develop bots that help users engage with the other side. Mm -hmm. So I said you have a, an argument about climate change or should have to find climate change. And then you can say, okay, there are arguments pro and cons. These are actually from Kialo, which is an online website with arguments on such topics. And uh, here's actually what was happening. So we had the, our argument. We said, let's discuss whether all humans should be vegan. And then uh, the user might say, I disagree. It's not just practical on, it's not practical on, a, on a global level. 
then the bot might say something like, vegans is necessarily flexible and so on. So it tries to bring some arguments for the other side. Now, and the point is that, you know, this actually, under the hood, essentially we have a main claim and we have the arguments that the, uh, so the argument talks about the particular claim and then the user might use an argument and the model might pick another argument against it and so on. And uh, so, and uh, we evaluate that. Now, we evaluate from open, for open-mindedness and I want to be clear that this is not meant to be persuasive. Right? So the point here, the inspiration for, the, for this was actually the so-called ideological Turing test. So I assume most of you are familiar with the Turing test, where essentially a, a model can pass itself as a human to a human in a conversation. So the ideological Turing test is essentially, imagine uh, you, are a, um, you are kind of a dedicated meat eater, anti-vegan. You think really people should just eat meat as much as they can. And the point is that, uh, you know, and, you know, the logical Turing test is that then you would have a conversation with a vegan and about veganism and convince that you are a vegan too. The point being that you understand the other side so well, you can talk about this topic as if you were one of them, but you're not. A bit like the system, the machine talking like a human, even though it's not. So that's a, the that's a premise behind it. Now, that's a, still actually uh, our psychological laboratories actually have a paper about it. Uh, now about how they actually developed the test. Uh, but uh, we actually, in the process of the project, we had to do something before they had uh, completed those experiments. So we used actually some proxy questions, which were due to another piece of research by Stanley et al. Where essentially things like, do you believe your ideological opponent has good reasons for their position? So we don't ask people to change their minds. We just ask them before and after the conversation, what do they think about their, their, their opponent? Do, are they, is there something, are they reasonable? In, not, they are, not that they are convinced. We also looked at other things, and uh, so we want our bot to be engaging, to have to be clear, consistent, and so on. And we did an evaluation. We found our bot was a bit better than other bots. Uh, there's a, a paper that is actually uh, we would write it as say we found also the balanced information actually that worked even better. We give them balanced articles, it turned out to be even better than our bot. So that's uh, but yes, but you know at least we could build a bot that was better than. Uh, other bots, but you know, we have to, there's more work to be done. Um, but you know, so far, what I've talked about is <laughs> essentially, <laughs> you know, I mean, being vegan or Brexit or any of these things, these are things that you cannot say there's right or wrong answer, right? I mean, you know, objectively. I mean, we can argue about things, but objectively, you know, we can't say that yet, at least, I don't know. Um, so, and then you find yourself on, but sometimes it's like, Things that you are, and you know, you find yourself in this situation, like you know, you can't stop, you can't go to bed, someone is wrong, and um, which doesn't sound very productive, right? <laughs> but there's other research, and um, so in in uh, uh, in sociology, where essentially, you know, is actually being having a democratic procedure. Is this actually leading us to better answers, or is it just like a nice process to have? But in terms of actual decisions reached, it's not better. We could do that. It doesn't improve anything, it makes us feel better because we're a better functioning society, if you like. So we went to, we, we actually, we kind of looked back at uh, Wason, 1968. So Wason, uh, British psychologist, had this uh, card selection task, uh, where essentially, so it's a very simple logic problem, uh, where essentially people uh, individually uh, get it wrong quite often. So the individual success rate, rate in reporting the literature is 10 to 20 percent. Now, when the same problem is given to small groups, four to five persons, the success rate, according to the literature, was going up to 8%. This is pretty neat, right? I mean, you know, this, it's the same people, presumably. Like, you know, they, they, they just asked them before and after the conversation from 20% to 80%. That's kind of fine, right? You know, how, how does that work? And um, we looked for, um, uh, so one of the ideas, in fact, these numbers are taken from this book, uh, is actually due to Mercier and Sperber, where essentially, the point is that the reasoning has evolved in the context of communication, not in isolation, not for us to think um, for ourselves, like, you know, common devices, like, you know, the point is that uh, we, the arguments we make help us justify ourselves to other, to each other, but not necessarily to actually decide for ourselves better. And uh, we're, because as we all know, I think, we're bad, bad judges of our own arguments, right? That's why we think we're right, we can take shortcuts, we don't even think about it sometimes, we just do them, right? And uh, and, you know, scientists are no different. That's presumably why we go to peer review, even though we also have some horror story to relate, or maybe perhaps, <laughs> or how our papers were misjudged or something. So, and um, so then the point is, that how can we help groups work better? 
So we actually have this project we call the Liberation Hansen Bots or Deli Bots. Um, and the idea is that we want to develop conversational agents that make conversations better. Now, the point is that unlike the kind of dialogue agents like chatbots, it's not just like um, to entertain, amuse ourselves, but we want to accomplish a task, right? We want to actually get the right answer to a problem, right? It's the right decision, if you like, or it's a decision. Two minutes, yes. Um, and and then, but unlike the task-oriented bots that are around, like restaurant booking or answering questions, uh, they don't know, uh, or even if they do know an answer, and maybe in a way some problem, they, there's an answer, it's fine, like the computer can find that out. They shouldn't give it, because the point is that they should help the humans to find the answer. Now that's uh, perhaps for the simple problems of evaluation, that's not the point, but if you think of points like hiring panels, or medical um, meetings, or all sorts of uh, committees that actually make decisions about real life, you probably don't want just the machine to give you the answer, but you want to improve the way the, the decision is reached. So we collect data because actually there was no data about this. No conversation had been collected on the waste problem. And we did that. And uh, I'll go a bit faster here and I'll say that our onboarding success rate was 11%. That's probably because we had mechanical techs as opposed to psychology undergraduates who are often the subjects of these experiments. <laughs> uh, but still, though, uh, success rate went up to 33%. And that was pretty cool. In fact, what's even cooler was that in 43.8% of the groups with a correct solution for at least by one person, um, no participant had chosen ethnicity. So they all had it wrong, and this one of them got it right. It's actually pretty good. And uh, so how do we improve the liberation then? Um, so you can see here, um, um, so we can ask things like, what do you think is an encourage people to speak? Or you can ask for reasons, why do you say this? Or maybe, what about this solution? So these are different kinds of probing, and uh, that's our hypothesis. That the, in fact, the probing for the reasons, ask people why, uh, is actually going to, what makes the difference. Um, on our findings are so far, we found that actually probing for reasons correlates positively but weakly, right? It's a weak correlation. Um, how we probe is, uh, so I think the choice of language is likely to matter, and as well as other timings and so on. Conversation length also correlates positively but weakly, and that kind of makes sense. Talking is fine, but you know, just talking for the sake of talking, that's not going to help you. So correlation, definitely not causation here, just like making people talking longer. <clears throat> Now we have built a daily bot that we've tested it. There's a more, small statistically significant improvement on how the group works with, uh, without the daily bot and with our daily bot. And uh, yeah, so we hope to have the paper out soon. Um, so the next steps on this is the real world application. So one is uh, detecting AI generated text and helping groups to detect that. Um, educational math games, I think that's actually a pretty big thing. Uh, you know, we want to improve math education and have actually helping people talk to each other about how they solve a, a math question, that would be very cool. Uh, peer reviewing, that's another one. Like we build all this technology, why don't we help ourselves? So how, to improve our peer reviewing, maybe we would catch mistakes like the ones I've already mentioned earlier, if we had some assistance. Um, so for data and more you can see here. And vision is on the one hand is education, as I already said. The other side is uh, healthcare. Most of fact-checking has focused on politics. And of course, COVID became politics and made healthcare political, but on the whole, it's still not as discussed as other matters in politics. And um, there's finding aids that I should thank, uh, but more importantly, collaborators. And uh, I will not take too much of your time, and I'll just show a photo of them here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, right, just before questions, I was going to say, is it all right? Because there's food ready. Joe, would you mind if yeah, we would to do the food first? Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's with my option. Um, so yeah, I'll now open up for questions. I think there's one right here. I wanted to ask about this, when you go to democratic kind of decision from 2020 to 18, do you see that it's also the case for like very specialized things? You know, I feel like, you know, if we are discussing which vaccine to take uh, mm. based on spike mutations, like, mm. would it still be beneficial to have people who have no clue about molecular yeah. biology in that discussion? Good question. I, I mean, I don't have a, you know, actually, whatever we do here is about small group deliberation. So the kind of scales that you probably envisage, like, you know, wouldn't be relevant here. Right, so I think that's a good question. I don't have an answer for that. Like I, 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 you know, I would like to think that with the right education, we can get the public to be pretty good at deciding things. Having said that, so sometimes a matter again, it's a race against time, right? You know, there's a disease rampaging through our society, and maybe waiting to educate people about vaccines might be too little too late. Like I don't, so I, I, I don't have an answer there. I'd rather, you know, I wouldn't. Yeah, I don't have an answer. But I can see the benefit, I can see the risk, I wouldn't go further there. Uh, 
Any others? We've got one over there. I was wondering what you make of the commonly held idea that Wikipedia is unreliable because anyone can edit it. I hear this all the time. Um, and what we can do to, I don't know, restore trust in it. Um, actually, I don't think of Wikipedia as unreliable. Right, is that what you No, no <laughs> we don't, but uh, a lot of people in uh, the general populace do. Um, yeah, so increasing trust. Uh, I'm not sure. I, okay, hmm. I think it's not just about Wikipedia, like, uh, you know, there's like increasing trust in, uh, in science. Uh, like, you know, it's, uh, in some sense, like, it's what um, uh, I think uh, uh, David was mentioning earlier, like, you know, we should actually work on the trustworthiness rather than trying to tell people we should trust it, right? You know, and I think Wikipedia is pretty good at it, but, I may, but I'm biased. I, I like Wikipedia, so I don't know. I'm not a good judge of that. So, I, I mean, one of the things that has happened, according to the International Fact Seekers Network, the, well, the Reuters uh, International Fact Seekers Network reports that uh, the trust in online media is, on the whole, has decreased. So that's actually a problem in itself, right? So Wikipedia is not mentioned in there, but uh, it could be suffering too. Uh, but then the point, how we increase the trustworthiness of of mediums, including Wikipedia, right? I I think. I think Wikipedia on the whole is uh, relatively under-resourced. Like the, num the number of staff, the amount of, you know, is minimal compared to media organizations or scale of BBC, say. So I think they have, uh, yeah, they need, you know, we could shut them maybe, I don't know. If we want, I, but I, I don't want to, to take Wikipedia as like, yeah, we should <coughs> trust Wikipedia blindly. And I think being critical about what we read is uh, more important, maybe from that, the trustworthiness from where we should. Let's do one more, and then I think we probably should yeah. stop because we're already running quite over. Go on. Yeah, go on great, ready. thank you. Um, I was wondering, for your golden standard, to what extent the Dunning-Kruger effect for the individual assessment? Oops. The Dunning-Kruger effect for the golden standard. Yeah. To what extent you have measured afterwards, and that plays a role, or you suspect? Um, we were not measuring that, okay. um, but maybe we should, I, 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 yeah, I, yeah, I, I think I've seen various things that know like. You know, more educated people have been harder to change their minds. I think it's difficult, right? Well, should they change their mind? I, I don't know. On the whole, I, I'm, I'm trying, you know, what, what we do is more, not so much about persuading people. Like, yeah. we don't, that's not our goal. Yeah. It's about exposing them to the information. Now, if it was presented in a trustworthy matter, maybe it's, it's not about, but they'll open their, they really, maybe the editor might choose to change their minds themselves. So that would be the ideal case, right? They're on us saying, you, you, you know, I convinced you. That's often not the case. It's better, you know, I don't have a wish for you, but I think for me it's like, if I think about it, I, I really change my mind in front of someone giving me threatening information in my opinions. But if yeah, it's done the right way, I go home, I think about it, and then, yeah, maybe I'll change my mind later yeah. with enough evidence. Because I can also imagine in a group context that pride plays less of a role. Maybe people might be more willing to submit in a way uh, if they've been really stubborn about something. If, uh, there's multiple input from other people in the same group, so the group think kind of allows for pride to disseminate mm -hmm. a little. I don't know, um, but yeah, I give up. Yeah, I mean, you know, this it's really early. I would like to, um, yeah, I think one got something uh, conclusive result on this waste on task, which is we started with that because in, we know from the literature or we knew from the literature that it should work there, groups should work there. And we were keen to see, we were very happy, actually, it still happened, right? They produced critical eyes and so on. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, it was great that actually we could verify that doing it ourselves without any reference to how they had done their experiments. So, yeah, but I think I don't want to extrapolate from that, yeah. you know, positive result, I'd say, to the world, real world. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes, thank you. All right, and with that, let's put another big hand together for... Uh, <laughs> so, in a